Welcome back. Most of us didn't know anything about the Hutus or the Tutsis of Rwanda until the genocide of 20 years ago. The film Hotel Rwanda told a narrative that my next guest, a Tutsi survivor, doesn't agree with. Edward Kayahura sought refuge inside the hotel from April to July and says the story we know, the story the world knows, is not the story they lived. He wrote a book to change the narrative with an American co-author, Kerry Zukas. Their book is called Inside the Hotel Rwanda, The Surprising True Story and Why It Matters Today. In Rwanda, we are all Rwandan today, yeah, but uh, before the 1994 genocide, Tutsi, uh, we had uh, three tribes, Tutsi and Hutu and Twa, and uh, the Tutsi were the minority of uh, the population. In 1994, uh, they were killed uh, uh, by the Hutu majority of the population. And uh, over 100 uh, days, one million people, uh, the ethnic Tutsi, were killed. Mm-hmm. Well, tell me about the Twa. Who were they and how were they treated during the genocide? The Twa is really uh, a small population, is like 1%. They were always sided with uh, the Hutu majority of uh, uh, the population. Can you give us some background on the colonization of Rwanda? First, it was um, colonized by Germany, right? And then the Belgians. Yes. Uh, the Rwanda was colonized by the German in 1894. And uh, when the Germans lost the, the First World War, um, the Belgium took over uh, in uh, 1926. So uh, in uh, 1932 is when they established an uh, ID card which differentiates uh, between Hutu and Tutsi and Twa. But uh, before that, the Tutsi and the Hutu were living together peacefully. They had no such differences between them. So what led to the genocide in Rwanda? Oh, as you know, um, the genocide uh, already started in 1959. Um, uh, Rwanda was a kingdom and the Tutsi had power. In order to rule them, the Belgium divided them. And uh, in the 1950s is when, during the period of independence, Rwanda also uh, tried to seek independence. Uh, the king at that time was killed, and uh, uh, the Belgium hel- helped the Hutu to fight against the Tutsi. And uh, many Tutsi fled the country in 1959, uh, and uh, they went to... Um, Burundi, Uganda, and Tanzania. Um, they stayed there uh, more than uh, three decades. Uh, or Hutu government refused them to come back. Any time uh, they try to come back, they kill the Tutsi who stayed inside the country. And um, in 19, uh, they killed them in 1962. They killed them in 1967. And in 1973, when uh, the military took power, they also killed the Tutsi, and uh, those who survived, they fled the country, those who stayed inside the country, they were discriminated, and they had no access to uh, education, they had no access to employment. Mm -hmm. So the Tutsi who fled the country in in 1959, uh, they tried to organize themselves in army to fight the dictatorship of uh, the Hutu government of the regime in 1990. So when they started the war in 1990, uh, is when the Tutsi who stayed inside the country were arrested and they were beaten. But uh, with uh, uh, the pressure of uh, international community, those uh, Tutsi uh, were released. Uh, since then, uh, the government tried to Habyarimana was forced also to accept uh, uh, military party. Then uh, he created the, the militia, he imported the machetes, he trained the militia, he gave them weapons, and uh, he est- established the hate media, uh, which was uh, demonizing the Tutsi tribe. 
until uh, 1994 in April when his uh, airplane was crashed and then um, the militia and uh, the military uh, started killing the Tutsi tribe. How did you come to be one of the 1,268 Rwandans who stayed in what we now call the Hotel Rwanda in April uh, 1994? Uh, it, it's a, I was lucky. I was lucky. I am a few uh, of Tutsi who had chance to survive. The, I left uh, my house at uh, 6 a.m. on uh, April 7, I flew to a friend of mine who happened to be a Hutu. I stayed in his house uh, four days. Uh, the militia, when I left my house, the militia came to kill me. They realized I was not there. They destroyed my house. Uh, they came to search for me at uh, my friend's house. Uh, I was uh, hiding behind a dresser in his bedroom. And uh, at night, uh, I was uh, sleeping in the trees uh, surrounding his property. So then, um, because they were looking for me uh, every day, so then uh, he was scary. He told me to leave. I decided to leave. But uh, I knew um, they were everywhere roadblocks. And uh, I had uh, my ID, which state uh, Tutsi, and I knew if uh, it's... Uh, it said Tutsi, it mean, meant death. It said Hutu, it meant uh, life. <laughs> so then I asked my friend to help me to leave the country, to go to the south of the, the, the country, because I was hoping maybe there uh, there will not be the killings. And uh, But I had no idea how I'm going to pass through the roadblocks. So then I decided to destroy my ID. And uh, on my way, uh, I had to pass to the local authority. Uh, in a thought came in, came in my mind to go to ask the local authority to give me um, just a piece of paper stating uh, I lost my ID. And uh, the local authority accept to give me that piece of paper. And then uh, my friend accepted to accompany me through uh, to get out of the town, but uh, because the, the the hate media were broadcasting saying that they are cockroaches, the Tutsi were labeled as cockroaches, hiding in Hotel Milkolin, I said, oh, instead to die on roadblocks, it's better to die with other people. So then uh, my friend accepted me to take me to go to the Hotel Milkolin, and we had to pass three military roadblocks. On the first one, I was asked to lay down. Uh, when they checked uh, my ID and they found that I had no uh, ID, so they told me to lay down. When they were ready to kill me, uh, my friends said, please don't kill him. He's ours, meaning I am a, a Hutu. So mm -hmm. then uh, they released us, and uh, we finally get uh, to the Hotel Milkolin. That's where uh, I spent those days in the Hotel Milkolin. You write that the movie presented a story filled with falsehoods. Uh, tell me some of those. Uh, the movie really is uh, a movie. Is a movie. Is a Hollywood movie. Is for uh, commercial purpose. And um, there are some. Uh, if you see in the movie, you will see um, the hero of the movie, Paul Sabagina, who going outside to bring the food for the refugee, which is not true. He didn't bring any food for the refugee in the Hotel Milkoli. You will see him uh, holding kids coming to the hotel, uh, which is not true. He didn't uh, bring any kids in the Hotel Milkoli. You will see him with the the evil people who committed the genocide, who planned the genocide, uh, like uh, Colonel Bagosora and uh, uh, General Bizimongo and uh, George Rutaganda, the vice president of the militia, all of those relationships are true. They were coming inside the hotel, they were drinking with him, they were partying with him. Those relationships with, uh, with the evil people he pretended he used those relationships to save us. 
which is not true because the hotel Mirkorin was protected by the UN peacekeepers. And uh, you never seen those uh, UN peacekeepers in that movie. And uh, uh, another thing, he was not the manager of the Hotel Mirkorin. He was the manager of Hotel de Diplomat. And uh, when the genocide started, the people, the, the Hotel de Diplomat, the host, the, the government, uh, the extremist government, and uh, the high ranked militaries who were planning the genocide. He hosted them and uh, he cooked for them. And uh, he came to the Hotel Milikolin in April 16. And we were at least 500 people in the Hotel Milikolin. No one had no problem. We were eating, we, had, uh, we were drinking. But he, when he came, he changed the, the way we were living. He, he had a meeting with the employees. He asked them to set up a cashier in the restaurant and uh, anyone who need food, he had to pay. And uh, we had no money. Some people had no money. Those only who had money can go to the restaurant and get food. And those who had no money were to starve. Uh, he started asking people to pay for rooms. If you don't have m money to pay for rooms, you were removed from the rooms. So all of those... Uh, all of those you see, you don't see them in the movie. He, the movie make him as a humanitarian man, as a non-political man. But uh, those Rwandan, we know he was a politician even before the genocide. Uh, even today, he's a politician. He has a, a political party, Pede uh, Erihu Mure. He's the president of that political party. And uh, before the genocide, he was executive secretary of uh, the MDR party, which was involved in the genocide. So there are so many fiction in the movie. Uh, and uh, after the movie, he goes around the country here, especially here in the USA, uh, telling what we saw in the movie is, 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 is a true story, is what happened to him, which is, really, uh, which is not true. How did he appoint himself manager of the hotel if he was manager of a different hotel? Are they owned by the same company? Yeah. The hotel the diplomat was uh, the government, the Rwandan government hotel. But uh, the management was owned by Sabena, which owned also the Hotel Milkolin. So uh, because he was in the hotel the diplomat and the Rwanda Patriot Front knew in that hotel, they are the government and the military who were preparing the genocide. The Rwanda Patriotic Front started shelling bombs on uh, that hotel. So the government was obliged to leave that hotel and go to free the capital and go to the south of the country. They had to pass to the Hotel Milkolin, which was one mile away. So when they arrived to the hotel, Mirkorin, Rousseau Sabadina came to the hotel Mirkorin, and uh, when he assessed the situation, he realized they were no management because the royal management of the hotel Mirkorin had left the country, uh, was uh, evacuated with other European people. So when, uh, when he assessed the situation and he found there is no management, he tried to get the keys from uh, the front desk employee who had those keys. And uh, the front desk employee refused him the keys. So Rusei Sabajina called the corporation office. They sent him a fax authorizing him to manage the hotel. That's how he'd been able to manage that hotel. Would you say he protected everyone who profited from the situation? He was uh, uh, profiting from uh, the refugees. He was uh, making business on the people who were waiting to die. Everyone who was uh, in Hotel Milkorin had no hope to survive. And uh, him, he was uh, doing business with the, 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 the George Rutaganda, the vice president of the militia, going out uh, by the the, the liquor, the beers, and come to the hotel to sell to the uh, the people who were in the hotel Milkolin. 
the hotel mirkorin the people who were in the hotel mirkorin most of the they were people who were living in the in the capital they are well businessmen uh, those people few of them had money uh, when we started drinking the swimming pool water uh, that's when the people felt to try to drink those beers on uh, people uh, uh, sold at expensive price and when he bought them from uh, uh, the president of uh, the militia on uh, lower price how did the un and other peacekeeping forces respond to him they must have been aware of his behavior yeah they knew they knew if uh, the based on the testimony uh, given in our book by uh, the general Dallaire, they suspect he was collaborating with the 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 people who prepared the genocide uh, he had even requested them to remove the un peacekeepers from the hotel uh, but uh, any any time the militia tried to attack the hotel uh, the the un um, general uh, general Darrell tried to convince the army to stop those uh, militia to come to kill the people in the hotel mirkolin mm-hmm. In 2007, Rusesa Begina called a conference on truth and reconciliation. You call it a conference of genocide denials. Yes. When you look at the people who attended that uh, meeting, all those people, they were are the people who denied the genocide. Either they were the lawyers who... Uh, who uh, the lawyers of the people who committed the genocide or scholars who uh, wrote who denies the genocide uh, surprisingly to attend that uh, conference and the people who wanted to attend the conference they were checked they were look uh, they checked the, they put roadblock to see people who were coming if you are not uh, uh, the people on the genocide or the people who are against the Rwandan government, you could not enter that room. Uh, it was uh, it was the same roadblock they used to during the genocide. Edward Kayahura and Kerry Zukas discussing their book Inside the Hotel Rwanda: The Surprising True Story and Why It Matters Today. And we'll have more after a break. It's the Bob Edwards Show on Sirius XM Public Radio. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. I'm joined by Edward Kayahura, a Tutsi survivor who lived those hundred days in the Belgian-owned hotel. Kayahura wants to set the record straight about the Hotel Rwanda because the movie does not. He's here along with American co-author Kerry Zukas to talk about Rwanda's past, present, and future and their book, Inside the Hotel Rwanda, The Surprising True Story and Why It Matters Today. We knew before that day, we knew one day we will be killed because we, the hatred was uh, uh, ev- every day the radio were propagating, the, the, the political party were uh, demonizing the Tutsi tribe, and uh, they openly called us, uh, called the destruction of Tutsi. Uh, they told us one day they will kill they, they will kill that they killed us we were expecting one day to die but we was hoping also we we will have maybe a, a peaceful transition of uh, uh, the government if uh, abjarimana accepted to 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 share power with uh, the opposition party and uh, the rwanda patriotic front we were expecting that time to have that uh, uh, we had that hope that maybe we will we would not be killed. Uh, unfortunately, on uh, sixth, I left my um, my job and I went to watch uh, African Cup of Nation that day. And um, I left before the game was over. It was nine thirty, but I had no idea that the president uh, airplane was crashed when. Uh, I arrived in my neighborhood is when uh, I realized the the militia because they were patrolling the area all the time. But that day they were grouped in small groups listening uh, those radios, and uh, those radio were calling to the destruction of the Tutsi. They 
they they were saying oh the Tutsi killed our president you have to find them and kill them so i was scary i just went to my house and um, i tried to find evidence because i knew they would come to search my house and kill me uh, i tried to find any newspapers i uh, which criticized the government i destroyed everything i had and uh, i could not sleep i just uh, stayed on my bed until until early morning when a, a coworker of mine who was uh, was in the extremist group uh, wake up in the early morning going door to door waking the Hutu the militia to start killing the Tutsi in our neighborhood when i saw him i knew they would come to my house and then i left my house that time you went to see your friend Pascal. Yes. Who is Hutu? Why why would he help you? Uh, they are okay, we we were divided but uh, they were they were also the people who refused to follow those um, ethnic hatred ideology. They they they, they 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 were people who or Hutu didn't or Hutu were not involved in the killing. Some killed and but all were not involved in the killing. Carrie, how did you prepare to help with this book? Edward uh, approached me a number of years ago uh, saying that he wanted an American co-author uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, he wanted uh, an American point of view in the book uh, since this was going to be published in the West and he was now living in the West. And secondly, English is his fourth language, uh, God bless, because I only speak English, uh, so I have much respect. But there was that cognizance that if the book came out eloquently written in English, uh, certain detractors might say, well, you know, we know you didn't do this all by yourself. So uh, Edward is a very honest man. He wanted to get out in front of that and admit, yes, I had some assistance from an American. And uh, that was right off the bat, uh, the nature of our relationship. And I respected that. And um, I was intrigued by the story. I had seen the movie when it first came out. And like most Americans, took it as gospel truth because unlike most movies that are uh, on based on nonfiction, there were no qualifiers at the beginning of the movie. There was nothing that said based on a true story, inspired by a true story. A few years later, after it came out, it was being uh, put into high schools across the nation. There were curriculum guides that were put together. And all of this was done in the spirit of this having been a absolutely factual story. When Edward told me uh, what it was really like, uh, I was very, very shocked. And I definitely wanted to learn more. Have you been to Rwanda? No, I have not yet. I look forward to doing that someday soon, though. <laughs> Well, someone who wasn't in Rwanda during the genocide, tell us what it took to sit with this story. Well, if there was one thing that the movie did accomplish, it did get across the message of the genocide. Unfortunately, in America, African news is a page 26, page 46 kind of thing. It's not front page news. And we see that today with things that are happening in South Sudan and other uh, imperiled nations in Africa. It's a very sad commentary that we have a lot of junk news on our front pages, even our most respected major newspapers and media in this country. But uh, the more I learned about this, the more fascinating, fascinated I was by the true story. Again, the movie Hotel Rwanda definitely at least got across to people that there was a genocide and that part they got correct but it was everything else that was in the movie um, the human interest angle which was the Rusessa Begina story uh, I learned through Edward was uh, completely trumped up we read in the book mass hysteria and hate are fertilized through something called the big lie one complicated hate-filled lie is far simpler than the truth Truth has nuance and requires explanation. The big lie is black and white with no shades of gray. Edward, what was the big lie? Uh, the big lie was uh, the people who were con trying to convince the the general population to be involved in, in, in the genocide, they were telling them, 
Tutsi, your neighbor Tutsi is going to kill you. Be aware the Tutsi are going to kill you. They lied to them because no Tutsi were, had, had no arm to kill his neighbors, Hutu. But they were making uh, the, the Hutu to feel fear from uh, the, the neighbors Tutsi. So they were convincing them, if you don't kill your neighbor Tutsi, he's going to kill you. So then the all majority of the population uh, stand up and uh, kill the Tutsi. Were you surprised that it was so easy to get people to kill? No, it, because it happened uh, in the 50s, it happened in the 60s, it happened in the 70s. So to tell them to kill, it was a, a, a wake-up call. We were lived in a, we were living in a divided society. Uh, they were Tutsi were was like a second class. We had no right as the Hutu had. So to tell them to to kill the Tutsi, it was the Tutsi were like uh, were labeled as cockroaches. It's just to tell them step on them. When you step on a cockroach, cockroach, it just die. So to tell them to kill the, their neighbors, it was easy. Uh, and if you look at how they killed the, the, the Tutsi, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, they used all low-tech weaponry to, to carry out those executions. Uh, they killed old people, they killed the young, they killed babies, they hit them on the wall. Uh, really, really, it was like, was done by uh, a, a brutal forces, not a human being. How many were killed? Over one million were killed. Were you surprised there was no international response? We were surprised because uh, we had the uh, UN peacekeepers there. Uh, we we hoped we were, uh, they would protect us, but uh, when uh, the genocide started, uh, when the one group of uh, the UN peacekeepers who were protecting the uh, Prime Minister Wirinjimana Agat were killed. Uh, the UN, the the, the Belgian withdraw its 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 militaries. So uh, instead to to send more militaries, they reduced the the number of the peacekeepers who were there. So um, we were shocked. We were shocked to see how the international community sent the troops to evacuate their nationals and they left behind the people who who were getting killed yes it, it's a shame for the international community it's a shame for the uh, for everyone there's a phrase in the book the tampon zone what is that uh the when the Rwandan government and the UN and the, the Rwanda Patriotic Front, uh, in order to negotiate peace agreement, they created a zone between those uh, those uh, the Rwanda Patriotic Front military and uh, where the Rwandan government military were. That zone between them were called Zone Tempo. Mm -hmm. Is it true the hotel was not the only place for Tutsis to find refuge? That's true. Uh, there were so many hotels in uh, the country. We had uh, uh, Hotel Merdien, we had uh, a Hotel Amahoro. Uh, we, the, we had churches. The Tutsi went anywhere who they felt they could be saved. So some Tutsi went to the Hotel Merdien, others went to the Hotel um, Amahoro, and the others went to the King uh, Hospital. And the Hotel Mirkorin was only one hotel, which was in Rwanda government zone. So the Hotel Merdien, the Hotel uh, Amahoro, and um, the King uh, Faisal Hospital was were in the zone controlled by the Rwanda Patriotic Front. So in those hotels, they were also refugees. And uh, they were also UN peacekeepers who were protecting those people. And they were also protected by the 
a Rwanda Patriotic Front Army. Tell me about the reconciliation efforts after the genocide. After the genocide, uh, Rwanda was completely destroyed. They had, uh, we had nothing. We had not even paper to write on. But uh, when uh, they set up uh, a new government, the objective was to uh, bring uh, the people who committed the genocide to justice and to reconstruct the country. We believed the, the justice system is the only uh, the only way to reconcile the, the Rwandan was was uh, the cornerstone of reconciliation was the justice. But we realized that uh, it would take uh, 200 years to bring those people who committed the genocide to justice. Uh, the Rwandan government uh, tried to find a way how they can uh, uh, bring those people to justice, and uh, they use uh, the what we call the gachacha. Uh, it was an uh, old system. Uh, it's like like uh, a dispute resolution uh, used here, and uh, we used that time to solve the the small dispute between people, like this, like land. So the Rwandan government used that uh, system to try those who committed the genocide. The objective of those uh, uh, those uh, gachacha court was to speed the trial and to learn the truth what happened and to reconcile the 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 people. Those who pleaded guilty were released, go to the community, live together with other people, and now more than one million when was were judged through those court. And uh, people are living together. They are living together. Yes, the conciliation is a process. The, we have a long way to go. Uh, we can't say everything is perfect. But uh, uh, I now we the Rwandan are living together. We don't have any more. The government has uh, put uh, policies which uh, prevent discrimination among uh, Rwandan. We don't have any longer that uh, ID card stating you are Hutu, you are Tutsi. Uh, we are all Rwandan. And uh, I think the Rwandan has made uh, a big progress in reconciliation. So you can go home and see people you know to be murderers of your friends and relatives and neighbors, and they're walking free. That's true. Does that upset you? It upset me, but uh, I also I have to learn, we have to live uh, in uh, 20 years has passed. 20 years has passed and we have to uh, to give up something in order to, to build uh, uh, a new country. Uh, those people, we forgive them. We forgive them and uh, we we, fo we don't forget. We don't forget they killed us. We don't forget they killed our people. But uh, we have to move on. We have to live a life. We have to, and now I have kids. I have uh, a family. Uh, those kids, they have to, uh, we don't have to be kept by the past. Uh, we have to move forward. So what is Rwanda like today, given that history? Rwanda is a peaceful country right now, and um, it has, uh, when you see it, you can't really uh, think uh, what happened in 1994. And uh, people think it was over uh, it, because it was completely destroyed. And now we have, uh, it's a peaceful country. It's, uh, the poverty was uh, decreased. Uh, the children are going to school without any uh, discrimination. Uh, the people, the healthcare, they have um, healthcare. The healthcare system is 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 is, is perfect, and uh, the economy is improving as well. Uh, life of Rwandan uh, changed completely. It's just amazing. I, I just can't imagine that happening, but I'm glad for it. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Edward Kayahura and Kerry Zukas discussing their book, Inside the Hotel Rwanda The Surprising True Story and Why It Matters Today. <laughs>